Right today, lesson 19. We'll start this lesson by looking at more of the signs that you're likely to meet in music and that you need to be able to recognize and understand. You'll find them on the first page of your lesson 19 booklet, page 217. If you read through this section, it should be clear enough what these four signs mean. If you do still have any doubts about them, you'll find they're quickly cleared up when you actually meet the signs in practice. Moving to the bottom of page 217, you'll see some abbreviations, shortened forms of words, that are always cropping up in written music. As we said in the last lesson, Italian is often used as a sort of international language for music, and all these words are again Italian in origin. Rallentando, or just the abbreviation R-A-L-L, -L, tells you that you have to slow down. It's an effect that's often used at the end of a piece of music. The opposite is accelerando, or ACC, speeding up or accelerating. You've already come across crescendo, getting gradually louder, and its opposite, diminuendo. The shortened forms are cresh, that's C-R-E-S-C, -E and dim, D-I-M. The letters D-C stand for da capo, telling you to go back to the beginning of a piece and start again. Finally, there's a reminder of the stop sign used with the chord accompaniment, which you met in the last lesson, in Blues in C. Do try and remember these signs and abbreviations if you can. But if you find you've forgotten any of them, you can always refer back to this page as a reminder. Now let's get down to some actual keyboard playing again. You've already practiced playing third staccato back in lesson 12. But playing thirds in a smooth legato style requires a bit more effort. We've got together a series of exercises for you to develop the technique you need. And they're well worth the trouble, because you'll come across legato thirds quite often in the future. To start with, let's look at the first line of exercise 207 for the right hand. How are we going to set about playing it? First of all, relax your wrist and your forearm as much as you can. Then, let your thumb and third finger drop onto the notes C and E, making sure that the two notes play exactly together at precisely the same time. Now, still holding down C and E, lift your second and fourth fingers, ready to play D and F. Then play D and F, at the same time relaxing your thumb and third finger so they lift from the keys. Next, reverse the process, holding down D and F, until your thumb and third finger play C and E again. You can go on doing this for as long as you like, until the whole thing is perfectly smooth and easy. Your hand shouldn't move at all, only your fingers. Once you've got the hang of it, move on to the second line of the exercise, where the second and fourth fingers alternate with the third and fifth. The principle is exactly the same, but you may find that with the third and fifth fingers, it's slightly more difficult to make the two notes sound exactly together. The fifth finger tends to lag behind a bit. The only answer is to try again and again, listening carefully to your playing and slightly adjusting the position of your fingers until finally it comes out right. And remember, stay relaxed. If you tense up, everything will get ten times more difficult. Here's what exercise 207 should sound like. Exercise 208 is exactly the same as 207, but for the left hand instead of the right. The technique is also exactly the same, though naturally right-handed people will always find it more tricky to play this sort of exercise with their left. Here it is.
In exercise 209, the last of each group of four quavers is staccato. This lets you shift the position of your hand slightly each time, and so move up and down the keyboard. If you follow the fingering correctly, there shouldn't be any problem. Exercise 210 is for the left hand. Exercise 211, for the right hand, has a series of minims that you hold with your thumb while your other fingers play thirds. It's designed to get your fingers moving independently, as your thumb stays anchored in place. Exercise 211. Exercises 212 and 213 are played faster and introduce a black key, E flat, in the third and fourth bars. As you speed up, try and make sure that you're still playing the two notes of each third exactly together. Here's exercise 212 for the right hand. Exercise 213 is for the left hand. Exercise 214 for the right hand is very similar to number 211 with a minim held by the thumb, while thirds are played by the other fingers as quavers. But this time there are black keys involved. Exercise 214. Finally, two exercises with the hands together. Here's exercise 215. As you'll have noticed, all the previous exercises were in 4-4 time, indicated by the C, written in place of the time signature at the start of each piece. But exercise 216 is in 6-8 time, that is, with two beats to the bar. You'll find that your hands have to move around the keyboard quite a lot in this exercise. While one hand is playing its group of three quavers, the other hand has time to move into position over the next group of notes, ready to drop onto the keyboard when its turn comes. Try to get into position in good time, so that you aren't rushing at the last moment to find the notes you need. One last point about exercise 216. We said a long time ago that although the right hand usually plays in the treble clef, above middle C, and the left hand usually plays in the bass clef, below middle C, this isn't necessarily always so. 
Before the fourth bar of this exercise, the treble clef appears in the left hand part. This means that the notes that follow are middle C and E, D and F, and E and G. Then the left hand returns to the bass clef again at the end of the bar, bringing everything back to normal. So, here is the last exercise in this set, exercise 216. Haydn's Andantino is our solo piece for this lesson. Andantino is another of the words used to suggest how fast a piece should be played. It normally means slightly faster than andante. And andante, as you know, means slowish. And if that sounds vague, it is. You have plenty of scope to interpret the piece at the speed that sounds best to you. Andantino is in F major, so all the Bs are flat except where a natural sign contradicts the B-flat key signature. You'll notice several of the signs for loud and soft that you met in Lesson 17. Particularly, watch out for the crescendo and decrescendo, or diminuendo, marks. The second half of the piece, from the top of the second page, is played twice. The first time through, you play up to the end of the two bars under the sign 1, the first two bars in the last line, then you go back to the beginning of the page and repeat it again. But this time you skip the two bars under one, ending with the bars under two instead, the last two bars on the page. So the second time through, you jump straight from the second to last line onto the second bar from the end. So let's hear Haydn's Andantino now. And by the way, we'll lead you in with five metronome beats. That is, the three beats we would usually give you for a piece in 3-4 time, plus an extra two for the missing two beats of the first bar, where you start playing only on the third beat. And Antino. Now let's take a look at some more rhythm patterns with chords. As usual, we provide the chords and the rhythmic notation, plus an example of how the exercise might be played. Exercise 217 is fairly straightforward.
For exercise 218, you'll need to count carefully at first to get the rhythm right. Notice the effect of the tied note on the second half of the third beat in each bar. Exercise 218. Finally, in this sequence, exercise 219. Watch the use of the repeat sign that you first encountered on page 217. It tells you that the rhythmic notation shown in the first two bars continues through to the last bar. Only the chords change. Exercises 220 and 221, at the bottom of page 225, are in part a preparation for our piece with orchestra in this lesson, Venetian Adagio, that we'll be coming to next. The exercises show you how to move up and down the keyboard playing legato thirds. On the way down the keyboard, this involves using a version of the thumb under technique. In fact, you'll probably find it's not physically possible for you to play these thirds perfectly smoothly. At the start of exercise 220, for instance, you have to play C and E with your thumb and second finger, followed by D and F with your thumb and third finger. You can play the E and the F legato, holding down the E until you're just beginning to strike the F key. But there virtually has to be a break between the C and the D as you lift the thumb from the first note before using it again to play the second. So in general, with these thirds, it's all right as long as one of the notes moves legato to the next. You can see this principle at work in bar five of exercise 220, where the thirds are going down the keyboard. You start by playing A and C with your second and fourth fingers and then play G and B with your thumb and third finger. So far, so good. But now we come to the thumb under passage. You need to slide your second and fourth fingers over the top of your thumb and third so as to play the F and A. In fact, it's almost impossible to pass your fourth finger over your third. But you can, of course, slide your second finger over your thumb. So this is what you do. The thumb holds the G, while the third finger lifts off the B. Then the second finger slides over the thumb and plays the F, while the fourth finger plays the A. And the thumb lifts from the key at the last moment, so that the legato is provided by the thumb's note G linking smoothly with the second finger note F. This all sounds awfully complicated, but it isn't really. When you play the exercises, you'll find it's more or less common sense. Just follow the fingering accurately and concentrate on what you're doing, making sure that at least one note from each third is smoothly linked to a note from the next. Here's exercise 220 for the right hand. Exercise 221 is also for the right hand, this time with the black key F sharp included. Watch out for the move from the thumb and third finger to the third and fifth fingers at the end of the first bar.
Now for our piece with orchestra, Venetian Adagio. You already know that Adagio means slow and expressive. The music is in 4-4 time, as you can tell from the letter C that stands as time signature. The key signature is F sharp and C sharp, so the piece is in D major. Don't forget these two sharps throughout the Adagio, except where a natural sign intervenes. The flat stress marks over the chords in the left hand you first met at the start of lesson 18. The word simile in the third bar means similarly, and it tells you that you should imagine the stress marks continuing above the chords for the rest of the piece. Watch out for the tied notes in the right hand part, which give the adagio its distinctive rhythm, and try to follow the loud and soft marks that should fill the music with expression. The only real difficulty lies in the thirds in the right hand at the top of the second page. It's best to practice these separately until you're confident you can handle them all right. So, here's the complete piece, Venetian and Adagio, with keyboard and backing. And now, here's the backing without the keyboard part.
Finally, to conclude this lesson, we're going to try some more rhythm practice in exercise 222. As in the previous lessons, this exercise doesn't require a keyboard, just tap out the rhythms to the metronome beat. Here are a few examples. First, number 31. Number 35. You'll find that number 36 is the same as 35, although it's written differently. In fact, there are quite a few pairs of identical but differently written rhythms in this exercise. Now, here's number 37. Number 41. And finally, number 45. Now, we'll leave the metronome beat for you to practice with.